Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing so far? All I see is an energy level of 10 out of 10. That's what I see. A lot of good content so far? You guys enjoying everything? Excellent, yeah. Sound of applause for the I really do like the sound of applause, I'm not going to lie. I know it's not very good towards me, but anyways. Really excited to have you guys here with the home stretch of day one of our conference. Um, today's session uh, with us today is Linda Souza, you've met before, our VP of Marketing. We're going to be jointly presenting a really interesting session, something that really Linda has incubated uh, a while back, and that's trying to understand the different collaborator types and how, one, you work with them, and two, you set up both your system and your culture to appropriately uh, uh, address the types of ways they like to work together. So I'm going to hand it over initially to VP, uh, Linda Souza. Welcome. So as Mark said, um, he and I will be co-presenting, and we're basically going to go over the different types of collaborators, all nine of them we'll take a look at in depth. Hopefully all or most of you have taken the quiz by now, you know what a collaborator type you are. Um, then we'll talk about how we stack up. So um, we've looked at sort of the universe of all quiz takers and what the distribution was among the nine collaborator types. Uh, we've also sort of benchmarked central desktop um, and our collaborator types internally because we figured, you know, we are a collaboration uh, solution, we eat our own dog food, so. We did not have any choreography planned, and we shall resume. However, Mark will gladly dance. He likes to do that. <laughs> um, so we'll take a look at Central Desktop and what our distribution is, sort of just as a benchmark um, for you know a super heavy user collaboration. And um, then we'll also take a look at the Clavis Sphere attendees who took the quiz. Um, I basically tabulated all the results from everybody who had taken it by Thursday afternoon. So there are a couple people that I thought came in on Friday, but we should have gotten the bulk of you. Um, so you can see sort of your distribution. And then we'll talk about grouping strategies. So once you know the different collaborator types, the good things about them, the more difficult things about them, then we'll talk about how can we get them all working together so that when you have some users that are a little more reluctant or a little more problematic, how do you, you know, kind of help them get up to speed and, and kind of get the others to help you champion it internally? Um, does anybody know who this is? Taylor Swift, right. And do you know what happens to you if you break Taylor Swift's heart? <laughs> That's right, she writes a song about it. <laughs> the ladies knew that one. Um, does anybody know what happens to you if a marketing person catches you looking at all their files? No. They create an infographic about you. <laughs> um, and here is where I ask before the conference, I asked our two resident stealth ninjas, uh, Alan and Chris, if you could sort of give a little wave to everybody. There you are. That was the inspiration behind the nine collaborators. They were actually the first character, the stealth ninja. Um, but before we go into that, um, let's just sort of set the scene, and then uh, I'll turn it over to Mark to talk about the first group. So basically, collaboration amplifies everything. Really, you see all these personality types really come to life. Probably these collaboration styles existed before open collaboration, but somehow via the technology, it's just a lot more noticeable. Um, I know even in personal life, for example, a few years ago before I came to Central Desktop, um, I'm on Facebook, so I was Facebook friends with one of the systems analysts from the other side of the company who was in a separate office, and I bumped into her one day, and as we were leaving, she was like, by the way, how was the Alcove, which is a little restaurant in Los Feliz? And I looked at her kind of taken aback, and she was like, well, you did eat there yesterday, right? <laughs> <laughs> totally forgot I had posted that on Facebook, and even though people don't necessarily comment on everything that I post, they're there watching, <laughs> lurking. So, you know, when you're in a collaboration system, just like with something like Facebook, if you post it out there, people see it. Even if they don't comment on it, they may still be aware of it. And really, you know, and then there are people who maybe are a little bit shyer, but, you know, when you, you when you get to uh, a medium like technology, they're much more likely to 
comment, sometimes they even throw barbs at people or you know say things that maybe in person they wouldn't. So collaboration really amplifies everything and this is where these collaboration styles really sort of come to life. So with that I'm going to turn it over to Mark to talk about the power users. Awesome. Thank you so much, Linda. And before we kind of jump into this, can I just get a quick show of hands on who here has taken the quiz already? And please keep your hands up if you don't mind. I'm going to have Linda roam around very quickly. I'd be curious, I'm going to probably pick on a few of you and have you tell me what type of collaborator type you are. And then most importantly, was there anything about that that surprised you? Were you surprised by the results? So keep those hands up real quickly. And I see a lovely person in the, let's call it the fifth, fourth row. Um, there we go. Christy McKnight. Yeah. Oh. Fantastic. Let's start there. I'm a self-mentor. <laughs> was that at all surprising to you? Yes, it was. And how so? Um, because I think I'm thinking of myself as being pretty direct. Okay. Excellent. Who else? Keep your hands up, Chris. Just want to know. There we go. I came out as a taskmaster, uh, but trying to stick with that sometimes I guess pretty type A and want to get everything done. So I, I thought that fit pretty well. Okay. Good. <laughs> Couple more. Brave volunteers. I was also a task master, which I guess is pretty good because I had up the DMO in our agency. Anyone else want to share? Well, I tested out as a task master too. Um, my team absolutely hates, hates me for it. <laughs> it does, in fact, fit. Yes, in fact, when we were organizing this user conference, Mark assigned many, many tasks to me and the rest of the team. Yeah, it's not surprising at all. <laughs> okay, well, we want to take a look at the different collaborator types. And really what's interesting about the collaborator types in particular is that you kind of can categorize them into three main groupings of, of users. The first of which I'll talk about is the power user. So let's start with the very first one. Anybody uh, show up at the ringleader out of curiosity when they took the test? Okay. A lone ringleader. There we go. These are the big idea people. So specifically, these are the ones you definitely want on the team. They're the ones that are actively promoting collaboration throughout the organization. They're starting discussions. They're getting people psyched up. They have the bullhorn. They're ready to go. And they're actively seeking out additional people to bring into the fray. Um, one thing that's sort of a cautionary tale about these folks is they can be a little overwhelming. They're opening a discussion every five minutes. They're soliciting opinions on a variety of topics, oftentimes 10 and 20 a day if you're not careful. Um, and so there is certainly a cautionary tale about these folks, too. That they, the strength is they're heavily involved-oriented. Uh, the caution is they can be a little overwhelming. Um, but more interestingly is the, the, the folks that they tend to be most compatible with. And that tends to be the executive, who at that level is also sort of a big idea person. And so those two tend to work really nicely together. Um, with the caution, of course, being the siloist who really prefers to kind of just work on their own and stop asking me questions, stop trying to involve me. Um, but the ringleader is definitely a power user. These are folks that are heavy, heavy users, heavy involvement, heavy social e e engagement within the organization. They love the same page book concept. <clears throat> they do. <laughs> the second is the expert. No surprise that our power user, right? These are the collaboration champions. So these are folks who... who uh, separate from the, the previous, are looking for additional and new and creative ways to take processes that exist today and transform them in the product. So they're always thinking outside the box like, gosh, how can I use a database to automate that process? How can I make this faster and quicker? So these are the folks that know the system end to end. Were, were anybody in this room happen to, to be an expert by chance? Carl, I'm not surprised. Fantastic over there too as well. Excellent. Uh, the, the caution here is they have a tendency at times, at least in the feedback we've received from folks that work with these types of, of folks, is that uh, they can be a little uh, arrogant at times and perceived as condescending because I can't believe you don't know this particular feature. I can't believe you're not using that. And so the cautionary tale there is uh, certainly making sure that the tone coming from these experts is not one of, of top down and a little um, assertive, I'll say. Um, they tend to be very compatible, however, with the executive as well. The executives who look at the organization top down and say, how can I make things more efficient? How can I make things more organized? Um, how can I make my team work more productively? All of those things. Uh, they're also clearly uh, compatible with the ringleader, no surprise. Uh, certainly because the ringleader wants everyone in the tool in the first place. And if the expert has the keys to the castle and knows how to make things work well, uh, they certainly are compatible. On the cautionary side is the dinosaur and the skeptics that we'll get to in a bit. 
Um, the dinosaur being one that really prefers to work out of you know, a DOS-oriented uh, system. Maybe they've just upgraded to, uh, I don't know, uh, Windows 95. Um, and also the skeptic as well, who looks at every tool that's been introduced and says, do we need this? I don't understand. How does it work? I don't get it. Um, and it's also a flip side on the cautionary tale too, that the dinosaurs really probably wants to learn a new tool, and the expert needs to sort of adapt their style on how they try to bring those types of folks into the work, into the tool itself. And really the third power user is the socialite. Um, I think these folks have uh, a cloud score probably of 90. They're Twittering and tweeting and Facebooking and blogging and doing all sorts of crazy things, and they're heavy, heavy users of the social components of the tool. They're the life of the party. And so these are folks who are trying to rope in as many people as possible. They use the system heavily. Um, the caution, of course, is that there may be what we may call a bit of oversharing. Like, I really didn't even know that you got sick to your stomach after eating that turkey sandwich two hours ago at lunch with your friends. <laughs> um, so these folks may have a tendency at times to be a little oversharing. I know I'm going to pick on you, Susan. Uh, you test up. Susan's on the implementation team here at Central Desktop. And she tests out as a socialite. If you know Susan at all, you know that she absolutely does fit the bill there. Uh, but if you wouldn't mind very quickly sharing with us what it was like to be tested out like that and how you ended, how that affects how you use the tool. Um, I wasn't surprised. I think if I had it come out as anything else, I would have been more surprised um, because part of what I do is being online and it's something I'm very comfortable with. Um, and it was interesting because I, I don't want to be the person that's sharing that I got sick an hour ago eating lunch, but sometimes I might accidentally do that. Um, so it's always nice to kind of keep in the back of my mind, do I really need to be sharing all this information with everybody? Um, but it worked out really well, and it, it's always nice to know kind of what you are, and it helps me work and try to get some other people to interact in the system itself. So it, it's kind of good. Yeah, the socialites definitely take advantage of the social tools to bring people in initially uh, in hopes that they'll not only you know, become more social in the tool, but also become more productive. So they use that as one of the leverage points to get people in. They tend to be very compatible with the ringleader. Kind of, again, no surprise there. Ringleaders want people in. Socialites want people in the system as well. As well as the taskmasters and silos. These are um, folks that, uh, by and large, um, are, are people that are using the tool. Uh, the cautionary tale here is actually with the Stealth Ninja. The Stealth Ninja um, uh, is one that's looking at every single thing. And so if the socialite's posting quite a bit of content on there, they may be wondering, why is this person looking at every single thing that I post into the system? Looking and not contributing. Lurking and not yeah. um, So that's sort of the grouping we call the power users. I'm going to uh, hand it over to uh, Linda, who's going to talk a little bit more the second group, the reluctant user. Oh, thank you. This is actually my favorite group. Um, although I know that they're also the most challenging. But, um, so, first, siloist. This is a person who's usually very, very private and uh, is a little bit reluctant to have everybody look, you know, see what they're up to or know too much about them. Um, on the plus side, uh, usually when they are sharing things, it's more complete. They don't want people looking at things that are only kind of half-baked or half-done um, because they, they feel like that might represent the whole body of their work kind of done. So usually when they do upload something, they've probably been working on it, you know, on their own desktop or whatever, and then they upload the final product. Um, the challenge with this person, though, is because they're not doing everything in some sort of central repository where it's also saved and, and uh, not uh, subject to bad hard drives or things like that, um, there is a possibility they might lose files or information. Nobody can get at it except for them on their own machines. Um, certainly if they're out of the office, sometimes, you know, in the last uh, two sessions back, we talked a little bit about my graphic designer who happens to be the siloist, and that's the case. You know, we have to go digging on our computer to find the right file. And they do have slightly weaker ties to other teams because they're not participating in the same manner as some of the others. So they haven't built up those relationships um, quite as well as some of the others. Um, compatibility, uh, most so with the ringleader and socialite, although they may find these two collaborator types a bit annoying, um, just because they're trying to pull them in. Uh, it, it's exactly, it's precisely for that reason um, that they do tend to get more engaged with those two types. Uh, the, the key there is just the socialite or the ringleader posting about things that are relevant to the siloist and, and them responding. Um, oh, and I have caution for siloists. I, I think that was probably supposed to be dinosaur. 
there. So um, certainly because uh, the dinosaur, who we'll talk about uh, in, in the next two, um, because the dinosaur is also a little bit reluctant to use the system, sometimes if you have two people who are equally reluctant, they might sort of band together in, in unity against using uh, an open collaboration tool. Um, so the dinosaur, I actually like the dinosaur. I think the dinosaur is not so bad. Um, the thing that's great about the dinosaur is even though they're a little bit reluctant to get on board with new systems, they don't really like change so much. Um, they do they do make sure that if you're going to be doing something, whether it's implementing a new system or a new process or whatever, it needs to make sense. It needs to be for a purpose, not just I want you to do something differently just because. It needs to be easy and logical. It needs to save enough time uh, and not be hard to do. So I think that that helps us, you know, in terms of both developing a system that works in the easiest way possible, as well as the way that it's configured, the way that you're using it internally. It really sort of holds your feet to the fire to make sure that um, you're building it in a way that is easy for users and makes sense, really helps them in their day-to-day -day work, and you're not just you know, giving them extra hoops to jump through. Um, the caution here is they do require a lot of hand-holding to get them comfortable with it, um, you know, to, to really uh, get them working in the system, and they do still tend to prefer to, you know, sort of like the siloists, they do tend to keep a lot of that knowledge to themselves. So it's really, you know, your challenge there is just to sort of elicit that from them, um, because they really do have a lot of value to add. Um, most compatible, uh, most compatible is with the expert. So again, the expert is the person who just knows the system inside and out, and they've got interesting ways of uh, coming up with how to do things and automate the processes that maybe are really challenging or take up a lot of time or whatever. Um, and they can really speak to the dinosaur in, in a way that will help them use the system, ease them into it, as long as they have the patience. Um, and caution again here. Uh, uh, you know, another reluctant user working with a skeptic or even a siloist because they'll tend to, you know, if there's somebody who's sort of resisting, they'll tend to sort of jump on board and say, yeah, I'm not doing it either because they don't want to. Skeptic. Um, skeptics are interesting. I think there are actually two different types of skeptics. And this is the one I think you really have to watch out for. So in my mind, there's the skeptic that no matter what you do, you're never going to win this person over. Um, they're just, you know, it, it doesn't even matter. They're, they're just going to sort of poison the well. Um, the other type of skeptic, uh, I think, is actually a much healthier form, and that's the person who, yes, they're they're asking a lot of questions and they're poking and prodding and playing devil's advocate, and you know, but they're really bringing up legitimate pain points. And I sort of see this person as sort of like your consumer, like a version of a consumer reports within a person. Right, because they're asking all the questions and they're gathering all the information. Before they actually do something, they need to be convinced that this is the right way to do it and that this makes sense. Um, the, I think one of the benefits of a person like this, this type of skeptic, is that once you do win that person over, I think that what they have to say, their opinion actually carries a lot of weight with other people as well because they understand, yeah, this person doesn't just go along for the sake of going along. This person has done their due diligence or whatever, and if they're, you know, doing this, then it must really make sense. Um, so compatibility, um, here I think the expert really, the skeptic is gonna ask some really hard questions, and a lot of really hard questions, and they're really gonna push the boundaries. And because the expert knows things so well, knows the ins and outs, and has really creative solutions using um, the solution, I think, you know, that right there, there's going to be uh, great compatibility. And then caution again is with dinosaur or even with the, you know, the, the siloist. Um, again, if you have those two negative personality types working together. Purpose-driven user, I will let Mark go through these guys. The purpose-driven user. So we'll wrap up the remainder of our nine collaborators with the last these are the purpose-driven users. The first of which is the executive, and I'm going to allude to this a little, or share this a little bit later, but roughly 40% of all of you in the room here that took the quiz actually tested out as executive. 
And so I have a fair amount of confidence that I'm appealing to at least some of you in the room. Uh, but not surprisingly, the executive is the leader of the pack. Again, they're not necessarily, as we've statistically tested out, uh, actual executives. They're just the way in which they approach their business. Um, but some of their core strengths include being able to and having the authority to make decisions and providing feedback quickly. Um, so these are folks that also want to look at sort of the top-down view of how the organization is sort of set up. Um, they're ones that, that understand sort of the, the high-level pain points of the organization, perhaps. Um, the caution here, though, is that they don't get deeply involved in day-to-day -day collaboration. So part of the objective is to get this user to do things like massive amounts of safe status updates and participating in other discussions and all that. It may not necessarily work out that way, but these are folks who fundamentally want to understand how is the organization sort of running, utilizing the tool, getting the benefit out of it, and what things are we trying to put in place that make the business better. Uh, on the cloud, uh, compatibility front, uh, again, maybe not surprising, we've sort of talked about it before, is they tend to be fairly compatible with the expert. These are big idea people um, who are working with big idea people. And so oftentimes you'll see an expert paired to an executive because the executive has an idea on kind of what they want to see happen in their team, in their department, with a client, whatever. Um, and they want to pair against somebody who actually knows how to set uh, some, some improvements within the tool together. Um, on the cautionary tale, here is, is the siloist. Um, so in particular, the executive may find some level of friction with those types of individuals who would really prefer to work independently of the tool. And the siloists can also be fairly frustrated at the decisions that are being made that are affecting their, their workload on a day-to-day -day basis as well. We've talked a lot about the stealth ninjas slash make fun of them, um, but these are frankly, for, for, for no better reason, just purely curious people. Um, if you were in the session a couple sessions ago that Linda and I did, we talked a lot about one of the key drivers that sort of encourage people to do what they do in the system. And curiosity fundamentally is one of the largest things that we encountered, both with the nine collaborators uh, quiz, as well as just doing a lot of running of experiments that we ran um, in the last several weeks. But these stealth ninjas just by nature are purely curious people. Not just curious about what people are doing, but curious about the type of work that's getting done in the organization. They feel very comfortable um, having a better understanding sort of at an end-to-end -end level on what's taking place within the work that they do and the business that they work at. Um, and so these are folks who, who know pretty much everything that's going on. I can certainly ask one of the stealth ninjas in our organization, can you tell me what file was uploaded by Linda two and a half hours ago in this workspace? And they probably have an answer to it. These are folks that have the CD sidebar on the right hand side, activity stream all set to go, probably a number of RSS feeds, and their uh, uh, recent ever just, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the digest dialed up at every two hours, probably. I'm just curious, how many ninjas are in here? <laughs> oh, yes, we have many ninjas mm -hmm. among us. <laughs> fantastic. The caution here is perhaps on occasion, as maybe you've experienced, they may share some unsolicited opinions. Why are you talking about my file? I didn't invite you into that thing. Back off, buddy. Um, so on occasion, they can, perhaps especially for early users, appear threatening, um, a little, um, create a little bit of tension with a lot of users who are wondering why these people who I didn't want to talk to or discuss with are providing their opinion um, in seemingly unrelated topics to their day-to-day -day work. And so they may ruffle feathers from time to time. Anybody here, at least maybe early on, as you started using um, the tool, encounter that kind of behavior at all, wondering why people are kind of looking at your stuff early on? No, I guess they're really on the other. Oh, good, Susan. So and me. And you. There's yeah. two, it's three of us. <laughs> um, they tend to be most compatible with the ringleader. Again, these are people who kind of want to know everything that's going on, and so as a consequence to that, the ringleader who's doing everything and anything to get people excited about the tool and, and highly active. Um, they tend to be very compatible with those users as well. Uh, the caution, of course, here's the siloist who, if for random chance, one of your uh, creatives actually does put the file into a central desktop, will wonder why is this person looking at my creative file? It's really none of their business. That's our greatest fear. Yeah. And then we have the taskmaster who I quizzed out to, and, and it's probably no surprise. Some people say I walk around uh, and my brain works like an Excel spreadsheet. So. For better or for worse, that's, that's, that's who I am. I happen to like Excel. But anyway, these folks are the organizers. So regardless of what role you play in the agency or in your uh, organization, you are one that has any number of tasks that are assigned to you and to other people. They like to keep things on schedule. They understand the ideas of due dates and risk logs and all that good stuff. Uh, but these are folks that fundamentally in your organization are keeping projects on schedule and trying to enforce accountability. 
And so you may wonder on occasion, why is this person assigning me 14 tasks to a project I'm not entirely familiar with? Um, so you may get a little friction there. I don't know if some of you do that. I, I tend to do that and get, well, I've lost a lot of friends, let's be honest, when I do that. Um, they can be a little overbearing at times. So it's literally like, why are you over-processing something that seems very simple? And so the caution with them as well is making sure that they're balancing between tracking what needs to get done and not over-tracking to the point of, of uh, isolation. They are absolutely compatible with executives for the main reason that executives like to see something get done. They like to see something uh, actually in motion. They like to have a sense on forward momentum. And so these people are absolutely hand-in-hand uh, -hand with the executive. And again, the caution on the, our poor lonely little siloist who would frankly appreciate not being able to sit in a cubicle on the floor that nobody's occupying. Um, the caution there, of course, is why is this person assigning me tasks? I don't even like to manage my tasks that way. I don't like to manage schedules that way. Uh, please leave me alone and let me get my work done. And if you happen to be in an agency space, oftentimes this can be the creators um, among different types of, of personality types. Do any of you recognize some of these collaboration styles within your own organizations? Yes? Our whole team meets like that. Good <laughs> 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 you see their faces already. <laughs> Uh, so, for this, uh, as I mentioned, we actually took a look at all the stats from all the presentations. Um, I sort of did sort of the traffic light um, thing in terms of the uh, power users, the purpose-driven users, and then the more reluctant users. So, if we look at everybody who's ever taken it up until, uh, I think, mid-September when I pulled these results, it was about 2,200 people. Um, and you can see, um, you know, in terms of the power users, it's a small percentage, um, you know, not, not even quite 20% of the universe of people out there, um, whereas there were a huge number that fell, I would say, in some of the sort of caution categories. Some of those, I think skeptic is sort of on the brink. Um, you know, that style could go either way. It just depends on which way they sort of lead within an organization, how they work with others. Um, but this is what it looks like, you know, only 10% dinosaurs, so in, in terms of everybody who's ever taken the quiz. Then I looked at just central desktop people. Um, earlier in the year, it forced people to go take the quiz, a separate one that was just central desktop employees, so that we could see how we as a, as a collaboration company um, benchmarked against this. And as you can see, our, um, you know, all the areas in green are power users there. We've got a pretty huge percentage with just super large number of experts, um, you know, whereas we have very few dinosaurs, and the ones that we did have, frankly, claim they are not dinosaurs and would like to take the quiz again and resubmit <laughs> their results. You know, it's just because they don't have smartphones and such doesn't mean that they're not experts. Um, but this is how it turned out. And you can see we do actually have quite a few um, stealth ninjas in our midst skeptics, but uh, I think they are pretty helpful for us. Um, so Thursday afternoon, I, we had set up and sent an email, a couple of emails to all of you um, to take a quiz that it was the same set of questions and answers, uh, just a, a separate copy for Flavisphere attendees uh, specifically, and got the majority of results in here. So as you can see, um, a huge surprising to me percentage uh, of people fell into the executive category. Um, although given, you know, the crowd that we're talking to, I expected probably a lot in the executive, also maybe expert uh, here, and quite a few taskmasters as well. Um, very small percentage in those caution areas so that uh, skeptic silos, nobody tested out as dinosaur, at least not the second time you took the quiz, you know? You are. <laughs> um, and then we've got those uh, green power users as well. Not quite as high as I'd expected, but um, we've got some ringleaders and push. And uh, sorry, no socialites, ringleaders and experts. So if we just look at them across all the results, and it's kind of a big chart. But you'll see where the anomalies are. So really, executive is um, the one that's most pronounced in terms of the rest of the population. Even central desktop, only 9%. I'm in that category of the executive collaborator type. I just like to, I'm in it a lot, but I like to see
see and make sure I know everything that's going on in Fulton reports and status updates on things and stuff like that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, so, you know, for Dinosaur, we had nothing. So even, you know, versus central desktop numbers, that was a pretty good percentage. Um, and the other one, yeah, those were the two that really stood out. And then the fact that there were no socialites. So we actually have about 11, 12 percent. Part of that could be as well. I know, you know, from one of our earlier sessions, we talked about things like status updates and, and sort of the social aspect and whether that term even had a negative connotation. Um, and that could be part of the reason as well. Um, so for anybody who didn't take the quiz and would like to, um, just so you know, um, it's still out there and you're certainly welcome to take it and try it out and see what collaboration style you are. Um, and certainly if any of you here, if you wanted to do this, it's just a sort of fun little quiz, but somehow <laughs> most of the time it's right more often than not. Um, and certainly we could set up a separate one for you if you wanted to attach just to your organization to see what your work style internally looks like. Um, we will be distributing slides after the conference as well, so we'll see this one for anybody who doesn't have it right now. Moving personality. So now that you know the different collaboration styles, how do you apply that to your business? And what makes the most sense? So as we were thinking about this, we were trying to figure out, okay, great, so we have all these collaborator types, you all fall into one bucket or another, you have an organization filled with all these great people. What do you actually do about it? And that's obviously the key question. Uh, the first thing is obviously knowing who your collaborator types are, that's why the quiz is available. I highly encourage you to take it. Because at a fundamental level, knowing the different types of people you work with, knowing how they like to work, knowing what pushes them away, knowing what creates friction is, is clearly uh, the first step, right, in admitting you have a problem. Um, but more importantly than that, we looked at it in, in two different ways as well. Obviously, no work organization is able to cherry pick the perfect blend of these collaborator types in a way that creates the ideal situation. You hire who you hire before you ask them to take a collaborator quiz, and you get to know them over time. But we thought about two specific ways that you could try to maximize everybody, every unique collaborator types, I'll call it their collaboration potential. And so the first of which is you look sort of at the softer skill side, which is how do you try to group personalities or group collaborator types in a way that achieves a better result, a higher bandwidth of collaboration, et cetera. The second thing we'll take a quick look at is what are the types of features that resonate most with these people, and how do I look at the way I set up things like workspaces or whatever um, that appeal most to the different collaborator types. So we'll break it up into kind of two different parts. The first of which is grouping different types of personalities. And so when we look at working together, we sort of look at two different types of interactions, the positive and the sort of the not so positive. The positive interactions can include anything from sharing ideas, feeding off one another in a positive way, boosting the lower level user's desire and patience to use the product. The goal here is creating interactions that promote, as we've talked about before, better decision making, uh, better relationship building, better trust building, all of those great things that come from a truly great interaction experience. On the not so positive side, you, you have the negative piece, which is uh, a situation in which people working together may in fact create, I don't want to call it a hostile situation, but an environment where people don't want to promote their ideas, share their ideas, um, encourage the sharing of, of new um, opportunities to grow the business or whatever. And so you can create negative interactions that may in fact dismiss other people's ideas. Maybe it feeds off people in a negative way. We all know what it's like to work in teams. You can have a really great experience that somehow magically just happens, or you work really hard towards over time. And sometimes certain individuals who, based off of their collaborator disposition, are simply going to be more disruptive than is good. Um, and then finally, uh, a negative interaction is not grouped properly where um, you can actually diminish the power user's desire and patience to even use the product. So if you look at the power users, they're all about trying to promote use get people in there, solve problems, get really excited. But over time, if you're not addressing some of the structural ways in which you've organized these people to work together, they may just frankly run out of run out of steam and say, you know, I'm so tired of fighting this fight. And so how do we look at ways to best group people in any number of interactions, whether it be in a team, in a discussion, in an event, in a planning session, whatever that might be, that really promotes the right behavior. And we won't go into every single one of these, um, the, the, the details will be provided to you later, but let's just take a look very quickly as an example of the power user. We'll take the expert, for example. 
So it's, again, a reminder of what the expert is. This is a guy that knows the system in and out, wants to solve real problems, wants to bring everybody else in, get them enthusiastic about the product, so that they themselves have trans transformational knowledge to do that work themselves. We've talked a lot about who, who, who best to bundle these with, um, no-brainers, the socialized ringleaders, etc. But let's take a look also at the people we want to be mindful of. That if you're creating collaboration uh, instances where you're pairing these people up only to a dinosaur, a silos, or a skeptic, there's a lot of caution here. So I don't know if, uh, I think the benefit of taking the quiz is you can start to really look at your organization and understand, how do I have people teamed up and organized? Um, but ideally, you'd look at the expert and say, you know what, expert, if you're going to go full, full out and try to incorporate a dinosaur into the equation, you have to exude a sense of patience. You have to make sure that you're taking your time to understand why they're reluctant, why they're scared, why they don't like change, what is it about the change that's frightening them. And so the caution with the expert is, if you're going to pair them up to, that, to, to the negative, to, to, to the dinosaur, for example, I have to definitely make sure I'm mindful of my approach. Let's look at the social life as well. We'll take a look at the fact that they pair nicely to the expert, the ringleader, and taskmaster, but quite honestly, you're not ever going to get that ideal situation. You're going to have the skeptic, the stylist, and the stealth ninja. And so the socialite's going to have to understand that there are people in the organization that are simply going to look at this thing. It's one of the, the uh, consequences of, of being highly social and providing a lot of feedback through the tool. And so how do I make sure that if I'm looking at uh, different bundlings of users, I'm mindful of who's there and I'm adapting my approach accordingly? Um, so for these guys, um, again, you're going to have some people that really have a very positive influence. I think the, uh, the skeptics in this case are the most critical ones that you want to win over early on. So once you identify that you have some skeptics within the organization, and sometimes you don't even need a quiz to tell you that. You know, you know who this guy is. You know, it's the person in the meeting who's always asking questions or, or sort of poking at things, right? Um, so. You know, I would say in this case you want to really focus on the skeptic, you want to make sure that you don't have the poison the well type or have somebody that you don't proactively sort of address um, because you don't want them to, to sort of get the dinosaur and the siloist to get on the bandwagon with him. So um, in all three cases you sort of want um, each of these reluctant users to avoid the other two reluctant users um, because as I mentioned they'll just uh, sort of feed off each other in a not so positive way and it may create a roadblock for your initiative. Um, whether it's something, you know, you've already rolled it out and you have a team that maybe is just not playing nicely in the sandbox with everybody else or if you're rolling, you know, you've got new users coming on or whatever, um, you really want to ideally break them up if you can. Um, certainly the expert, uh, I think in all three cases, um, and mostly dinosaur and skeptic, uh, you know, because that person really understands the system super well, in the skeptic's case, they can answer all the questions in a very knowledgeable way and really help win them over. And in the dinosaur's case, you know, they've got the level of understanding necessary that as long as they exercise that patience, uh, they can really help the dinosaur get into the system and, and become part of the process and be able to even leverage all the benefits that the dinosaur brings to the table in that case. Um, and for the siloist, uh, there is really the interactions uh, are most positive where you have people who are very much engaging others, whether it's directing you know, conversations or discussions of, at them or topics that are very relevant to them. And you know, as people see uh, others sort of engaging in conversation, they're much more likely to get engaged. Uh, Purpose-driven users? Please. Right, I'll continue. <laughs> um, so for these purpose-driven users, um, for the taskmaster, again, this is the person that's you know, really on top of things. They're driving things in the system. Uh, they work very well with the executive, a lot of positive interactions there because the exe executives sort of want that high level. I want to know what's going on. And the taskmasters, they're getting things done. And also because they're so visible and present in the system. The executive most of the time doesn't even need to ask them questions. They know that it's happening and things are being kept on track. Um, Taskmaster also has a lot of really positive interactions with the socialite and the expert, again, because they're both power users of the system. They're, um, they're really uh, also very motivated and, and sort of playing by the same set of rules. 
Um, here, both the dinosaur and the phyllois will create some friction um, with the phyllois in particular because uh, you know they're not really part of the system and they're keeping their private information private. The phyllois really, or the taskmaster really can't see what's going on, uh, and you know it, it just means more manual interactions and phone calls if you need to chase down somebody because they're not doing things in the way that they should be. Um, same thing with the dinosaur, and then you've got just the hurdle of the technology and, and getting them to change the way they've been doing things, which may not be the most efficient, and the taskmaster is all about efficiency. Um, for the executive, so again, because the taskmaster is all over on top of things, and they're active in the system, you know, the executive can always count on that person. You know, when they're looking at reports, they're talking, you know, going to a meeting, they want to give status on, on different projects. They don't, most of the time, they don't even need to go talk to the person. You know, you can just go in there and you can see, okay, the person's on top of it. I don't need to go bug them about this. Maybe I have a few questions here and there, but I don't have to worry. Um, also, positive interactions with uh, the ringleader, because again, ringleader is very much an idea person, and they're always, you know, on the lookout for new information that they're sharing with people internally, they're really starting up, um, you know, different discussions. The executive may have sort of the overall directive, this is what I want to happen, and the ringleader is the person who also sort of rallies the troops and, and fires people up and sort of gets them moving in that same direction, so they pair together really well. Um, and the expert, of course, because a lot of times the executive, you know, may not have, you know, the time day to day to be in there tinkering with the system like the executive does, but the executive is very aware, here are the problems I need to solve with this system, and I need somebody to help me do that. The executive is great because they know the system so well, inside and out. They're sort of like the master tinkerer. They're always finding ways to improve and get things better. Um, and, and that really helps bring to life a lot of the ideas that the executive has. Um, on the negative side, the skeptic can be, a, you know, a little bit of thorns inside, uh, depending on how how that person is managed and, and whether they're sort of the, the type that I mentioned that's a little more difficult to work with, who sort of, you know, you're in danger of him or her poisoning the well um, with the other employees, or if it's just somebody who's just asking a lot of questions and can be a little bit exhausting. And, you know, they, they, there, there are also some uh, more friction points with the dinosaur as well because you just want people to just do it. Just do it. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of hand-holding there, and the executive usually does not have that kind of time. Um, stealth Ninja. Um, a lot of positive interactions uh, with the expert and the ringleader, um, because the Stealth Ninja is that curious type. I think that personality type also has a very broad understanding of what's happening across the company as a whole. Um, more so than pretty much any other user, the stealth ninja, ninja knows. And I think that's actually that person's greatest asset. And because they really know, you know what's going on, um, that just feeds into what the ringleader is doing. You know, the stealth ninja is part of that and, and what the expert is trying to accomplish. Um, in terms of friction points, um, certainly uh, the skeptic has uh, you know, the, the skeptic is the more vocal and stealth ninja sort of poking around but not really contributing. Um, dinosaur and siloist, uh, again, they're not super active in the system and that, uh, you know, the stealth ninja likes to know what's going on and there's just not that level of visibility. groupings that we put together. Um, obviously, within your own organizations, it's never going to be perfect. You're not going to have <coughs> one of each type or the same exact percentage of each type. Just like we saw with the results that we got when we looked at all the group takers versus central desktop versus cloudosphere attendees. You're not going to have all the same type. But in an ideal situation, um, you know, if you're if you're trying to make your initiative be successful, and it may be, you know, a lot of Customers here have already rolled this out and you're, you're well past that stage, but as you're ramping up, either expanding to other departments, as new people are coming on board as they're joining your company, or you know, as you're doing other expansion, um, ideally, uh, if, if you can sort of split up the ones that you feel might be detractors to your effort, um, 
and you know you certainly don't want them to band together because once they band together, it's a lot. They make a lot more noise. They make it a lot more difficult for you. So as much as you can proactively address them, do so. Um, and certainly, uh, where you can, it's great to take some of those power user personality types and help create champions. So you don't need to do it all by yourself. You can't. Collaboration is not successful all by yourself. So as much as you can help recruit um, those power users who are within your organization and sort of buddy them up with some of the others. Maybe sometimes it's even a directive where you're asking them, hey, I really want you to work with so and so. Um, that, that would be ideal. Um, so you'll see with each pairing, there's one uh, of the power user types, uh, someone who's compatible in the purpose-driven category and then also someone from the reluctant user. I think the big takeaway is split up your reluctant users as much as you can, and that'll help you a lot. Um, but certainly the pairings can be adjusted a little bit as best fits your organization. Want to wrap up? Thank you, Luca. So one of the things we talked about earlier on was there's this element of grouping by personality, by collaborator type, isolating those that may be a disruption, and then adjusting your sort of behavior and approach to them. Really the second component is the fact of the matter is this is a software tool. And so there are opportunities for you to take a look at different features that may be present in workspaces that maybe a lot of these different collaborator types are a participant in. And so when we look at people like the power users, um, it's important for them that they're leveraging sort of the the heavier and deeper and more sophisticated components of the system. So you're oftentimes going to see the experts leveraging workflows and databases. Um, those words don't mean much to other end users, but for these guys, they're looking at some of these hardier parts of the tool and trying to leverage them to make, again, business more efficient, solve problems, replace existing processes that may be a bit outdated. And so when we look first at how power users are using it, they're using those types of functionalities. When we also look at maybe perhaps teams and maybe team or department workspaces, client workspaces, and you happen to know that you have a power user in there, you can be sure that uh, they're going to want to take advantage of that whenever possible. The socialites, not surprisingly, and not just status updates, are pretty predominantly um, users of the status update and perhaps even of the discussion. It's all around creating conversation. And so, for example, in my team, when I look at all the different collaborator types that I have, and I think I have almost one of every kind, um, it's important that I create a workspace environment, a team workspace environment for them that's attempting to appeal to the types of things they like to use. And so, for example, in our implementation team workspace, I'm going to have status update in there as front and center, uh, oftentimes because a lot of the folks on my team may be of a social light sort of disposition. Uh, for those experts that happen to be on my team, and I have some, um, they are beating the heck out of the databases within that same tool. And so how do I look at different features I can activate that best appeal to these folks? And then the regulator is all about just trying to get people to have conversation, uh, get excited, learn about new ideas. They absolutely love the Save Page bookmarklet. Uh, we talked about that a moment ago. Uh, with respect to the purpose-driven user, when you're looking at what to activate and what they love to use, um, the taskmasters, not surprisingly, love our project management tools. Um, they're leveraging them high, highly. They're assigning work uh, a lot. Um, and so I happen to have a pretty strong taskmaster on my team um, who's leveraging that quite a bit. Every time there's a project that comes up, lo and behold, they're absolutely opening up a new milestone. They're assigning 50 tasks to other people with reminders. They're probably using the dependencies um, so they can keep a sense of how things are related to one another. Um, the Stealth Ninja um, certainly, we know, uses the recent activity. We know uses the email digest. We know uses the sidebar. And sometimes dresses up as a ninja and lurks around people's desks. Um, it's happened, I, I, I assure you. Um, they're obviously using recent activity. And the reason I bring this one up is specifically not just the aggregated sort of recent activity you can see in your dashboard, but for example, I have a team member uh, who's a stealth ninja, and they happen to really appreciate the recent activity within a workspace because for them, they actually just want to see uh, sort of the noise or the activity in the context of, uh, for them, a team rather than the whole list of activities. So for that particular collaborator type, if you happen to have them in a group setting, uh, in a team uh, sort of setting, that's going to be something fairly important to them. And you're definitely going to want to, um, to leverage those tools. The executive is always using the MyReports, reports, again, giving the 30,000 foot view of all the projects by workspace, of all the tasks that are incomplete. Uh, show me uh, any number of different ways I want to look at the world. Um, they're highly leveraging um, the, the MyReports reports component of the system. Um, 
and making sure that those folks know that that tool is there is, is useful. And then really on the reluctant user side, um, these are people who, by and large, they're either going to have a challenge getting them interested and willing and able to use the system, either from a product knowledge standpoint, an interest level standpoint. Um, let's go ahead and leverage a lot of the tools that make it easier for them to, to, to interact with the tool without having to log in feeling overwhelmed. And the silo is quite often loves to use the web folders because for them that's familiar to them. They understand that putting a file into a folder on my desktop is like I do work anyways. What they don't know maybe is secretly behind the scenes, it's actually uh, providing it back into central desktops. They have it, and it's avoiding all those issues of lost files and such. So trying to ease the transition for them, and maybe that's the first place you start with them uh, to get them you know, sort of promoted and using the system. The dinosaur as well, these are folks, again, who may be challenged in the technology department. Um, so leveraging things like email in is useful to them. Because again, if the goal is to get content and um, in interaction in the system, make it easier for them by starting there, perhaps. Um, if you're not already familiar with that, let's talk. Um, and then really the skeptic, who by and large is really uh, asking lots of questions and wants to understand what the benefit is. And when you're able to aggregate information that's specific to them, it starts to begin to feel very valuable to them. And so that's why the dashboard tends to be very interesting because it's like, look, there's this tool, you're all doing a bunch of work in it. I'm, I'm sort of reluctant to use it, I'm kind of scared and skeptical and I ask a lot of questions, but as you ease me into the dashboard, it starts to feel a little less threatening. And oh wow, look at all this information that's really relevant just to me. Um, and so those folks tend to use that quite often and it tends to be a pretty good entry point for them as well. So here are some next steps that we're going to encourage you know, from this session. I mean, we want to make sure and make these tools available to you as well. Is if you haven't already, uh, make sure you do understand who your collaborator types are. Like Linda alluded to earlier, we can actually customize the quiz that's unique just to your organization and encourage your folks to take that quiz so that you can actually see how your organization specifically sort of pairs up. I think you'll find some surprises there. I think you won't find surprises elsewhere as some of these collaborator types tend to be a bit obvious. Um, but that may be the first place that you start is, who am I working with and what sort of collaboration disposition do they come from? The second of which is once you know who they are, you're going to want to make sure to leverage the strengths and quite honestly, every collaborator type can have a strength associated with him as you saw before. So just because people are in sort of the reluctant category, as the skeptic is an example, doesn't mean that they can't offer significant value in the form of asking you know, questions meant to, to challenge to make sure we're doing the right things. But you're going to want to leverage the strengths by creating champions. Um, there may be group settings, like Linda mentioned a second ago, that lack a champion, lack that power user, lack that somebody that's going to infuse a lot of energy into the equation. So make sure that you're finding out if you lack that in a particular group setting and try to insert somebody like that. Oftentimes, if you have a group just of, of skeptics or a group of reluctant users, it's simply because they just don't know what they want to do and how to do it. So make sure you get that champion in there and, and, and make that sort of a formal step that you take in order to promote better collaboration in your organization. Um, as Linda mentioned earlier, in summary, proactively address the detractors. Nothing can be worse than having the not good kind of skeptic on your team and continue to just let them exacerbate uh, the, the breakdown in, in collaboration and true sort of relationship building. So pull them aside, make sure that you're addressing the situation up front so as not to uh, damage the rest of the team dynamic. And then also set up collaboration buddies. This may sound kind of cheesy, um, but it's actually true. If you do these pairings right, you, you start to see some very interesting and quick acceleration in getting people more confident in the tool, more comfortable. As I think Susan had mentioned at one point in time as well on my team, um, it caused her to become more confident in her work, which is really all we want across the board anyways, is people who like the tool and feel more confident in the work they're producing in it. Um, and then as we just talked about sort of briefly, and there's a lot more conversation to be had about this offline, frankly, if you haven't signed up for speed consulting, this would be a great topic to talk about. What's the best way to set up the system for these different teams, groups, clients, what interactions that appeal to the types of people I have there in the first place? Because nothing can be worse than having this great cluster of people and you've created uh, a, a team or work environment for them in, in a workspace that's not uh, addressing the types of things that they like to use on a regular basis. Um, and then finally, uh, it's probably worth noting because uh, it, it, it's, it's a real thing is you have to be patient particularly with the reluctant users who come from a disposition of fear, perhaps, anxiety, or whatever, it's, it's to be patient and perhaps sequentially step into promoting collaboration. One of the main things we do in implementation with any of our new customers is we, we, we suggest that they not try to tackle too much at once. And we've seen failed implementations over and over again for people, who are, for organizations who with the best of intentions 
are trying to activate every single feature they can because they can, completely transforming their workflow to a place that creates too much disruption. And so we're going to recommend that you have to be patient. Pick a couple of key things you want to try to accomplish. Create wins that make people excited and enthusiastic. Take those wins, transform them in other parts of the business, and you have a winning, a winning combination across the board. We wanted to sort of end off things with uh, a video that we've produced. This is Kevin. He's the manager of product support at our organization. He is very disappointed to find out, and I don't think he tests this way anymore, that when he took the quiz early on, he in fact was a dinosaur. It scared the bejesus out of me, frankly, because one, he's on my product support team, and he's a dinosaur. And I thought, did I do a bad high? I don't know. It was really because he didn't have a, a, a smartphone at the time, which I think he's since purchased. Um, <laughs> So here's just something fun to keep us up. <coughs> Twitter all day. You picked the best tweet too. I did. So the best tweet is also the winner of the 